Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Carruthers. I'm Senior Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Today, we're going to take democracy's global pulse, and we're going to do so thanks to the work of the Varieties of Democracy Project at the University of Gothenburg. And I'm really delighted we have with us Stefan Lindbergh, who is the director of the Varieties of Democracy uh, Project, in fact, the founder of the institute and the project. And he's also a professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg. And very delighted also that we have with us Brigitte Sein, who's an assistant professor of public policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And she's also a project manager for experiments at VDEM. And the Varieties of Democracy uh, project is really a remarkable research endeavor that has established itself as one of the leading ways to understand democracy in the world, one of the biggest analytic projects ever undertaken on the state of democracy in the world. So we're really excited to have the chance to review their new report, which is just out on Wednesday. Here's how we're gonna proceed. I'm gonna to turn to Stefan, who's gonna give us an overview of the report. And let us give us some material to really dig in and chew over some of the findings. Then I'm gonna engage Stefan and Brigitte in a conversation uh, for a while. I've got some good questions for them. We'll go into some of the depth, and some of the issues and in some real depth. And then I'm gonna to turn to comments and questions from the audience. So without further ado, Stefan, over to you and delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Tom, and uh, uh, I'm also delighted to be here. Both Brigitte and I are delighted to have been invited uh, to uh, Carnegie and this event uh, to present the res results of the report. Um, I will start sharing uh, the presentation. Uh, and <clears throat> this is the 2020, the, what the 2021 democracy report from the VDEM Institute, Autocratization Turns Viral. And let me just clarify the VDEM project. This is sometimes confused. The VDEM project is uh, a large international collaboration uh, with many scholars involved, uh, and uh, Brigitte is one of them. Um, she's also a former postdoc here at the Institute. Uh, and the Institute is sort of the headquarters, um, but the, the report comes out from, from us here at the Institute, um, and it's it's not vetted uh, throughout the, the bigger medium organizations. Um, okay, autocratization trans viral, that's the heading, and that's really what we are seeing is going on. Um, oops, what did I do now? Press the wrong button. That's a good start. Uh, I'll try again. Does it show? Uh, please say something because I don't see you. Uh, yes, yeah, it's showing. Uh, I think okay. that might be the last slide of the presentation, but you can see. God. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, um, it's been hectic here. Uh, my apologies. First right. and the last slide is uh, the same. Um, Autocratization turns viral. Uh, so in this report, we first look a little bit on the, uh, pand well, the pandemic backsliding. Um, we did a project last year where we monitored what governments were doing across the world in response to the pandemic and to what extent uh, what they did in violated international norms. And we're seeing now that the impact so far uh, has been maybe uh, a little milder uh, than we feared. Uh, most democracies we find have acted responsibly. Um, there are some exceptions. Um, among autocratic regimes in the world, there are more violations, uh, 55 countries that violate them moderately or, or have major violations. Uh, and we're especially concerned about the one third of all countries that have had, where still many have uh, emergency measures without a time limit, because we know from previous research uh, that such measures tend to stay for much longer than the original cause uh, called for. Uh, so there is something to, uh, for us to keep watching, of course. Um, but <clears throat> what about the democracy trends? So I'm going to show evidence of three trends. Um, <clears throat> one, that the democratic decline over the past 10 years, as many of us know, have, has been steep, but it's continuing. Uh, in in uh, during 2020, and now two thirds of the world population uh, live in autocracies as a result. Um, and if we look at the countries that are now autocratizing, uh, it's also accelerating. Uh, 
Uh, and one third of the world's population, 2.6 billion people live in countries uh, declining on democracy. And finally, that much of this is driven by an intensifying threat to freedom of expression. That includes the media, of course, um, and <laughs> the number of countries where we register substantial decline on uh, freedom of expression have <laughs> uh, close to doubled from 19 to 32. Okay, so evidence on the first one. Here is sort of the country averages that we we normally see, and from 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 also from other sort of uh, measurement uh, projects. Um, and here, it doesn't look like much of a decline, uh, neither on the world stage or in the different regions. Um, but in the, in these kinds of graphs, you have to remember that Seychelles, with less than a hundred thousand. Uh, inhabitants count as much as India with 1.4 billion people. We think democracy is ruled by the people, right? And therefore it matters how many people are affected. So if we weigh these averages by, um, the, by population weight, then these curves drop down much more dramatically, indicating of course that if we have large countries with uh, big populations, uh, uh, that are involved in this trend across the world. Um, and if we draw a line like this and look at what the average global, the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen, we're back to around 1990 or even before at the end of the Cold War. And that, I think, puts things in perspective. If we look at it in terms of regime types, um, then it looks like this. And you see, uh, the, the last 10 years here, uh, a decrease in liberal democracies uh, and an increase in closed dictatorships, as well as uh, a continuation of this long trend of increase in electoral autocracies. Um, now, 68% of the world population live in either than electoral or closed autocracies, according to our calculations. <laughs> so the first thing, is that this decline has been steep. Uh, we're back to levels around 1990 in terms of the average global citizen and electoral autocracy remains the most common regime type together with closed autocracies. They're home to 68% of the world population. <clears throat> Let's look at the countries autocratizing right now and a few democratizing, right? So here's what Anna Luhrmann and I have called the third wave of autocratization taking off around 2000 um, already, with the number of autocratizing countries increasing, where the number of democratizing countries have been sh in sharp decline, down to 16 now, uh, compared to 25 autocratizing countries. Right? And this, that period, and here is how the population share uh, looks for those, and here with an enormous increase in the last few years of, of uh, population living in countries that are undergoing autocratization. Um, and which are these countries? Well, here's a uh, local map. Uh, there, uh, it's nice to see the democratizing countries, Tunisia in the lead, um, but also some others, Madagascar and so on. Um, but fairly uh, small uh, countries with uh, fairly small populations typically, uh, and with very little influence on the global scene. Look at the red countries, like Brazil, United States, uh, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and India, of course, right? And then uh, a few countries in Africa, of course, but it's in all regions of the world and large countries with enormous influence also globally. When they autocratize, what was happening? So we looked at all the indicators that go into the liberal democracy index and looked at the indicators that start this change first and uh, has gone sort of the farthest. And it's a remarkable similar pattern. Uh, of course, the, these are the top 10 in terms of this magnitude of the decline over the last 10 years. Um, and at least eight of them follow a very similar pattern, right? Thailand military coup is a different thing. What's happening in Mauritius right now is also slightly different, but otherwise they sort of follow the same uh, playbook as uh, Erdogan in Turkey, right? First, undermine uh, 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 the freedom of the media uh, and uh, academic and cultural expression and civil society. The people that can uh, make 
a lot of noise about what you're doing and bring people out in the streets. And you couple that with disseminating uh, uh, false information, increase of that and polarize society uh, by also uh, more showing more disrespect for political opponents. This is uh, a table that shows you the extent of the decline on the Liberal Democracy Index from 2010 to 12. And with uh, India uh, among those, the seventh place, and has been ongoing for a long time under uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi. And in this year's report, um, we find that India is no longer qualified to be called uh, even an electoral democracy, but is an electoral autocracy. The decline here, if we look at it a little bit deeper, here's the black line is India compared to some of its neighbors and this decline uh, from uh, uh, around 2014 uh, and, and how steep it has been on the liberal democracy index. Looking at the indicators for India, it's, it's, it, this is what's driving it, right? So you have um, indicators that have changed negative most on the liberal democracy index here. And when you see a change of minus two, you have to remember that the scale to most of these indicators is from zero to four. So minus two is a really huge drop. And even 1.5 and one is a really significant drop, right? And here again, it's the same playbook with the government censorship of the media, uh, control of civil society and, and things like that. But also in India's case, especially with the last election, decreasing autonomy of the electoral management body. Um, there's some good um, uh, cases. Uh, here are the, the, the top 10 advancers, democratizers. And of course, with Tunisia there, Armenia, Gambia, and so on. Um, and many of them became electoral democracies over this period. But now troubles, well, Myanmar uh, military took over. We have uh, troubles in Georgia uh, and Armenia as well. A lot of protests going on right now in Tunisia. So even among the top democratizers, there are uh, a lot of worrying signs. So that's the second part here. We now have the several G20 nations that are among the countries autocratizing. Um, and, and when they do, it typically follows a very similar pattern. Um, and while democratization is happening still, it's still uh, occurring, but it, it typically in small countries. So thirdly, the threat to freedom of expression. So this, uh, what we saw with the top 10 autocratizers is much more general. Right? So here we look at all the different components of different varieties of democracy um, and which countries, uh, how many countries they have been declining substantially and statistically significant uh, over the past 10 years and how many countries they have been improving. Worst among them, freedom of expression. And that's where you have freedom of the media as well, right? 32 countries. That used to be 19 only a few years ago. Um, and if we look at the individual indicators in that, uh, in those components, um, here are the top 20 that have this most substantial or the greatest magnitude of change over the past 10 years. Eight out of 10 in the top uh, are uh, uh, freedom of, of uh, expression and alternative source of information. Right? Um, and then <clears throat> among the, the very, very top position is the repression of civil society in 50 countries. So that's the third uh, main message from the Democracy Report 2021. Um, <clears throat> a threat to freedom of expression intensifies uh, on that component index, 32 countries are declining substantially and was 19 just three years ago. Repression of civil society is another uh, main target uh, that civil society is. Um, and we registered the substantial de deterioration here in 50 countries over the past 10 years. That again used to be 20 some in, in only a few years back. Um, so those are the three um, uh, main messages uh, from that I wanted to highlight from this year's report and uh, say thank you for your time and looking forward to the discussion. The report is available online on the on the VDEM website where you can also download the data, of course.
uh, freely available all documentation and also use the online tools uh, if you don't want to download 30 million data points on democracy and play around with uh, they are available through uh, a set of 13 i think now online tools so on that note uh, let me say thank you and uh, stop sharing my screen oh tom we can't hear you Thanks very much, Stefan. Very good overview. Not a uh, very encouraging picture, but uh, we didn't expect uh, you get to come in with a lot of uh, rosy good news. Um, so let's dig in. Let's talk about some of the issues. I'm going to first engage with Stefan and Brigitte in a bit of a conversation, and then I'll look at the comments and questions. So my first question is, let's go back to India. The big, big case, crucial case, I was thinking as you showed the 48% to 68%, that if India had stayed an electoral democracy, um, it'd be 48% down. You know, the, the arrow might be going down rather than up. So India is really critical. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, was it a hard decision on India? Is it close to the line? I mean, the fact that you have electoral democracy and electoral autocracy, it's a bit of an analytic cliff. You're kind of one or the other. And moving a country from one to the other is, you know, it's a big step kind of analytic. I'm sure you didn't make a lot of friends in New Delhi when you made this step, um, or at least among uh, some people in New Delhi. So tell me a bit more about the this, this, you know, this analytic decision, as it were, to move India from one to the other. Yeah. So we we when when we talk about regime types here from the Vietnam Institute. Uh, we build that on the work that Anna Lurman and I did together with a, a, a grad student, Marcus Tannenberg, um, where we use uh, uh, the, both the liberal democracy index and the electoral democracy index uh, uh, to construct these regime types and make judgments about uh, when a, a country that is in decline eventually crosses some sort of line and and, and enters a different regime type. Um, we call that regimes in the world uh, measure. Um, and uh, uh, they, the, um, the, the, the critical point there for uh, between electoral democracy and electoral autocracy is <clears throat> one that you, uh, you drop below uh, 0.5, half of the scale. Um, and that we see that it's also sort of beyond that, that the quality of the elections, the critical institution mm -hmm. uh, in terms of free and fairness of the elections and, and, and that they're also free associationally for multi parties, that that drops down below the, the mid level on those in the individual indicators. Um, so that uh, it's, it's, it's uh, an attempt to uh, gauge really that, that the core function of electoral democracy, that you should be able to replace uh, mm -hmm. a leader uh, is, is no longer there to a sufficient extent. Mm -hmm. Then, I mean, we have a comment here. I'll be turning to the comments later, but we have a comment. Why do we, uh, from Gonzalo Colomodio, why do you include Brazil as uh, autocracy? I guess the same reasoning there? Oh, we don't. Brazil still counts as as a as a electoral a, democracy. A, electoral democracy. Yes. That's what I thought. Okay, I'm just making yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to keep directing questions to Stefan, but Brigitte, you just jump in whenever, or Stefan, if you want to refer something to, uh, uh, to Brigitte, please go ahead. Let's come back to the pandemic a minute, and I see a comment here about the backsliding and COVID measures of the past year. You say in the report, quote. Uh, the pandemic has, quote, not been used to substantially increase autocratization in most countries. So that was interesting because, you know, a common narrative in, I think, media accounts of the global political effects of the pandemic is the pandemic has really been a lever by which autocratization has advanced in a number of countries. So you're saying something different here, even though you say, you noted there were 55 countries that engaged in what you call violations of international norms for their pandemic responses. But you are saying it has not been used to substantially increase the autocratization. Could you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, and I, I would also invite um, ask Begita if if you have comments on this. But it's it's basically uh, when when we started to look at this year's data on 
the liberal democracy index and the developments in, in from 19 to 2020 and the differences um, there are on on the indicators that go into the liberal democracy index there are not that much of significant change um, and it's it to us it means a lot of what especially has been going on in the democracies right um, are have been legitimate um, uh, legitimate responses right there are international norms about this from the UN and um, the, what you're allowed to do in, in response of a pandemic and, and you're allowed to do have these uh, measures uh, quite radical restrictions on freedom of movement for example um, uh, with a time limit um, but I, I would I would say that uh, you know we were also a little surprised at how little um, the, the, the direct impact on, on the indicators for the Liberal Democracy Index was. That doesn't mean that it hasn't happened in some countries, but at mm -hmm. sort of the global big level, um, there, the, the, the impact of the pandemic so far, so far, uh, seems to have been um, uh, relatively measured. Interesting. Brigitte, any you want to come in on that or should I go on to the next question? Um, well, I would just say that another way of thinking about this is that we see some autocratic actions by certain governments in response to the pandemic. And this is of course concerning, but that doesn't seem to be correlated then with changes on these component indices mm -hmm. that make up the liberal democracy index. Um, and so I think uh, one case that I know relatively well, a good example of this is Nepal, where there have been issues with um, them taking action, strong action, controlling action in response to the pandemic, um, but um, that hasn't seemed to significantly detract from Nepal's democracy in at least a, a way that's tightly correlated. Great, thanks. That's a useful observation. Let's go on to the autocratization. You talk about a sort of a three-part strategy, a playbook is the term you use. Uh, go after civil society, demonize the opposition and polarize the, both the political life and the society, and then attack the legitimacy of elections. That sounds... That's familiar. But then when I thought about some specific cases, I thought, wait a minute, aren't there some other elements? And I was a bit surprised you don't mention them. For example, what about undermining independent judiciary, the rule of law? I think of Hungary going after the courts, Poland going after the courts, uh, Turkey. What about undercutting checks and balances more generally? And then what about constitutional change to centralize power, something they did in Hungary, something, of course, Erdogan did and others? So why aren't these part of the, the playbook that you talk about with autocratization? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with you completely that it has been um, an issue in, in the countries that you mentioned, um, but it's not as of a general pattern as we would be led to think uh, from those cases. So uh, the, the indicators we have in the in, in the index, for example, about the legislature uh, holding the uh, the executive to account or uh, the independence of the high court, uh, we see we see changes in some countries that are quite quite strong, but it's uh, the it's not a, a general pattern in the same way as these other uh, aspects are. Hmm. Interesting. Um... So there, you know, <clears throat> there is an autocratization playbook, but there's obviously variations in different ways. So you're pointing to just what you think are sort of the common pattern based on those, but there are some major cases. Because I was also thinking about the United States. You have the United States mm. as an autocratizing country in 2020. Mm. So of course, yeah. a rather lar large debate in the United States about what exactly autocratization under President Trump yeah. meant or consisted of. But I was trying to decide if it followed that playbook or not. There was mm. not what I would call a media crackdown. There were certainly criticism of the media, continual criticism of the media, but not an actual abridgment of the media's right to to, to broadcast and so forth. And um, so I felt like it also didn't. So when I looked at cases, US, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, even India, where there has been also some attack on the courts, I didn't see the pattern that you said. But if you're telling me the data tells you that in a larger number of cases, there is this pattern, then I guess that's what that's what you're emphasizing. Yeah, and I think in the United States, um, we also saw government efforts at censoring the media, intimidating the media. Uh, 
To what extent they were successful is a different thing, but there were certainly efforts at intimidation and exclusion uh, uh, and uh, so on. So, um, and in India, of course, that pattern is is very, very, uh, uh, very clear as well. Um, Hungary and, and, and Poland, much more pronounced, um, was a few years back already when Orban and his, his clientele, so to speak, controlled 98% of the media. Um, yeah. And uh, to give you a I mean, perspective on this, um, uh, sort of government censorship effort at the media is substantially declining in over 40 countries, uh, 43, I think. Um, uh, but uh, the, the attacks on the judiciary and the legislature uh, in countries that they are in decline, it's in uh, downwards to uh, around 10, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so we're, what, what I showed here in the autocratization pattern is the, the most general, uh, the, the indicators that, that are yeah, happen in, in most countries. Um, but also, yeah, I was, Birgitta, I, I, want, <laughs> I want to hear you here because the, that indicate one of the indicators that we see generally is also from this, the, the, the sister project here, or whatever you should call it, the Digital Society project, which is very common. So sure. maybe. Yeah, I was thinking this is a good time to talk about that a bit. Um, so I am uh, the principal investigator together with a few other VDEM project managers of the Digital Society project, which uses the VDEM infrastructure and expert surveys to collect data on online political actions, both by government um, uh, and as well as citizens. Um, and so I think some of what we're seeing with the importance of freedom of um, freedom of the media, freedom of information is um, echoed in the online space um, where we see some erosion of freedom of expression and freedom of the media um, online. So I'm going to just quickly share um, a graph about India. Um, and this will hopefully come through. Um, so can you all see this? Yes, okay, great. So you can see here that when we drill down to look specifically at indicators of online media freedom, um, instead of just broad print and broadcast media as well, um, we see the similar pattern and the decline of media freedom online. Um, so the government is um, increasing its tendency to here, let's see if I can get rid of this. Uh, increasing its tendency to, yeah, there we go, uh, to um, shut down the internet, um, shut down social media, um, censor, particularly censor social media. Um, and so I think this explains some of why this um, media freedom, civil society, suppression um, indicators are coming up so much it, when we look at the higher level indices and dem democratic trends or autocrati autocratization trends. Great. Um, I have more questions, but our, our audience is champing at the bit. And they there's three questions that all get to, people wanna talk about causes. They're like, okay, I get it. I see the picture, causes. There are three different questions. Jim Michael, James Michael starts with a general question about what are some of the reasons for the trends? Ray Jennings comes in uh, with a question that kind of suggests, it's an interesting question. He says, how does the tempo of democratic decline over the past decade track with metrics on growing inequality, increased migration flows, increasing competition in the information sphere? And then Shannon Green came in early with a question about role of external interference. A lot of talk these days about external interference and external pressure from autocracies that contribute to autocratizing trends. So I know, I'm not sure how much you deal with this or how much you've thought about it, Stefan, but could you say something about underlying causes and what's behind the picture that you're describing? Yeah, I think this is a $1 million question. Is that feedback in mind? Is it creating disturbance? Um, sorry, uh, I think that's a $1 million question that we are all uh, looking at right now. What's what's driving this and what are some of the general causes and, and, and the more specific for certain countries where we don't have answers. I think we need to acknowledge we don't have uh, uh, scientific answers that we we are, are certain about. Um, let me comment on, on, on a few of what was mentioned then. Where I did a little um, 
bit of analysis here at the Institute with some people the other year for, for, for Carnegie Europe um, on, on the relationship between increasing inequality and uh, uh, autocratization processes in Europe writ large. Uh, where there was a surprising, or surprising, but it was a very strong relationship. Uh, is that causal? Uh, yeah, well, I think there are good theoretical reasons to believe that it's causal. And one of the other questions here I see in the in the comments field um, uh, uh, speak about that, and that's a perceived threat, right? Inequalities uh, typically lead people then to feel more threatened uh, to their livelihood, their situation, the future of their children, and so on and so forth. We are still herd animals, and threat is a very dangerous political force, and we know that from the 1930s. Um, and when we are threatened, we want a strong leader to take us out of that threatening situation. And I think that's uh, one thing we need to analyze and discuss much more. Um, I th think we see sort of that type of dynamic in countries uh, uh, like Hungary in Europe, uh, but also in, in places like Philippines with Duterte uh, and so on. Um, external interference, yes. We're back to an age where the world is full of uh, leaders of big important countries that are outright enemies of democracy and are propagating. And it's not only China, it's not only China and Russia. Um, I know this is sensitive, but we have to be honest about that Saudi Arabia has been spreading a very extreme version of uh, Islam that was a small, small, small minority uh, in the world among people following Islam a more, much broader, more um, uh, 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 compatible with democracy versions of Islam that used to dominate the world. And they've been working on this since the late 1980s. And see, you have problems now in, in parts of Southeast Asia. You have uh, uh, the Sahel region um, uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, uh, and then you have the right-wing extremist groups that are gaining ground and propagating polarization and, and fear uh, across Europe, and I think in the United States as well, uh, and, and other places. Um, and there's sort of many of these different factors mm -hmm. and, and actors that, that they don't have the same goal except uh, attack democracy. Okay, let me um, go back to a question I had in mind. Uh, this is kind of a big one, and it's almost like a philosophical observation or question, Stefan, um, and I'm not sure there's really an answer to it, but I want to pose it anyway, which is when you say that, uh, what's the quote, that the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen today or in 2020 is at the level of 1990. Well, that's kind of daunting. Uh, let me put it this way. Does that mean the last 30 years of international democracy assistance has basically accomplished nothing? Are we, have, we, have we gotten nowhere in 30 years? Or is that something about statistical measures of relative versus absolute levels? Um, because it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit discouraging to think that in 30 years, uh, the car has been driving around and it's back to where it started. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think the one, one, uh, one, one answer to that is that uh, is no, because the, autocratization and declining levels of uh, democracy that we're seeing are not happening necessarily in the countries where the United States and other countries have been active with democracy support. Um, well, some are, of course. I mean, we have a lot of this going on in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, former Eastern Bloc countries um, that have declined a lot. Um, uh, but but the, the trend, for example, and Brigitte can also speak to this, as, is much more, uh, much less pronounced in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, and in some places, we're back to where we began. Uh, in, I mean, the Arab Spring in Middle East and North Africa, uh, essentially all countries except Tunisia are back to where they began uh, 10 years ago or worse. Um, so, so it's it's 
it's about the distribution of where this is happening. The advances in many countries in mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa that were made in the 90s are still there, or the decline is much less pronounced. So what do you say, Brigitte? Right, I think that uh, many Sub-Saharan African countries are kind of the unsung heroes of 2020, um, where we did not see, like you said, as significant declines, or even in some key cases, uh, such as Malawi, we saw some great advances in terms of democracy. Um, so I think I would agree with that. I think that it's um, the distribution is certainly not uniform. And so there is some reason to hope in some reason or regions in some countries. Hmm. Would a different way to look at it be, maybe this is just a bit of uh, optimism on my part, that over the last 30 years, there's been a tremendous increase in civic activism and, and civic ferment. I mean, compared to 30 years ago, that's that the range and the number and the scope of the non-governmental sector in many countries has increased, even if the political systems don't really reflect that. And the power of civic activism seems to me to be have increased in the last 30 years, even if the overall levels of democracy and employees. So when you say, for example, the Arab world is back to where it was in 2010, I'm not sure that's true. It is true in terms of regime types. But I'm not sure that's true in terms of the society and what's likely to happen and where sort of the political consciousness and space that people have been creating for political action is. Now, maybe that's, you know, you could say, well, that plus 25 cents gets you a cup of coffee. If you're still in a repressive system, it doesn't matter if citizens have this wonderful political consciousness, greater activism at the local level, more forms of organization. But I see it in terms of the surge of protests in the world that just published an article with Benjamin Press on understanding authoritarian protests, protests in authoritarian countries. A lot of authoritarian countries are having protests, many more than 30 years ago, uh, although you know, follow the Berlin Wall and that, but you have a lot of civic activism going on in closed systems. So is that maybe part of the, the answer to why it seems like we're not really back to where we were in 1990, but the numbers tell us we are? Uh, I Absolutely. Um, and I think this is a case or a situation where the online space is particularly powerful. Um, what we see in terms of trends in online mobilization of political activity um, is that it's it's dramatically increasing. And um, again, I can think of a few cases where that was particularly powerful, both online organization of political mobilization, just mobilization generally. Um, but I think that's absolutely true. Um, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that that we do also see a spike in the organization of violence um, and sort of the power of the internet to organize violent um, subversive activity as well as um, as well as protests and positive political action. So I want to get to a very political sciencey kind of question that two different uh, of our guests have posed. Uh, I think if you study political science, it's like people just can't get away from these questions. Presidential versus parliamentary systems and multi-party versus two-party systems. Do your numbers, you know, give us the answer. What's better? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, for this year's uh, report and the data that just came out a couple of days ago, we haven't, we haven't looked at, at this uh, yet. Um, it's, it's easier to, tend to be easier to, to, to polarize uh, a society in a two-party system context. Uh, there's less of moderation between the two parties. It's easier to pull them apart into, into the more extremes. Um, uh, you have less to lose from uh, sort of being on the extremes in a, in a two-party system. Um, uh, so, so that tends to be, I mean, it's, it's, it's not mm -hmm. an iron law, but it tends to be, be the case. And, and this uh, presidential systems uh, often have stronger executive powers and makes it easier for uh, the executive to broaden the scope of their influence and control um, and, and, and attack media, attack civil society, and then, as you spoke about, judiciary influence uh, elections later. Um, so there tends to be a, a, a sort of an easier, it's easier for the wannabe dictators to play the, the, the game in a two-party presidential system than, than mm -hmm. parliamentary multi-party systems. Okay. I was going to just bring up the issue of polarization in response to a few of the comments. Um, and 
and mentioned that while polarization worldwide seems to be relatively constant and not reflecting the, the trend towards autocratization, if you dig into the individual countries, um, India and Brazil being excellent examples, we do see um, dramatic um, increases in polarization, so more polarized society um, in these countries that are taking significant autocratic turns. So um, anecdotally, that I think that relationship is valid. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a general question. Um, Freedom House came out with their report last week, um, kind of a similar gloomy picture. Um, do you see, I mean, it's kind of reassuring that two major projects end up giving a similar picture. It'd be disturbing analytically if they didn't. But are there some differences uh, between your report and their report? Um, I think I think the, the 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 most important part is really that uh, what you mentioned that the the, the broad picture um, is very similar. Um, acknowledging here that uh, we measure partly different things, but uh, they uh, tend to also what we measure differently. These are also things that tend to move on a sort of on a global scale uh, together. Um, and uh, on on India, for example, they they downgraded India to party free. Uh, that's a, that's in you know, their measures of freedom, which is slightly different than democracy, of course. Uh, and and uh, uh, we found it to be an electoral autocracy now. So um, uh, there, there there are some differences. Um, uh, obviously, also different methodology and different indicators to some extent, um, but but it's it's. I would focus more on the, on the the commonalities here. Um, okay. Unless, yeah. Brigitte, you well, have a different. Well, let me let me pursue the question. Sorry, Brigitte. Let me pursue the question. Just this is a little bit of a <clears throat> democracy bingo, uh, or but democracy bingo for democracy nerds. Let me mention five pairings of countries which when I look in your report are different from the Freedom House report. You guys uh, have Canada below Greece. If there are any Canadians taking part in this, they're probably like, ouch, what? Canada falls below Greece as a liberal democracy, ouch. Second one, whereas Freedom House puts Canada way above Greece. Uh, second pairing, Romania versus Armenia. You have Romania below Armenia, whoa. Freedom House has Romania at 83 and Armenia at 55. Third pairing, Slovenia and Peru. Uh, you have Slovenia below Peru. EU member Slovenia is below Peru. Freedom House has Slovenia at 95 and Peru at 71. Turkey, below Egypt. You have Turkey is lower than Egypt. I think of Egypt as a very undemocratic place. So is Turkey, but it surprised me that Turkey was below Egypt. Again, Freedom House reversed. You have Russia below Vietnam. I think of Vietnam, wow, how much democracy is there in Vietnam? Um, Whereas is, is Russia really below? So those were five cases that jumped out at me that in your way of ranking countries is different from Freedom House. What, what mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to go through all of them, but just give me a reaction to that. And yeah. apologize to any Canadians who are taking part. <laughs> yeah, the Canadians, uh... Uh, would be angry. Well, we also have Denmark above Sweden, which is uh, yeah, of course with, that's cause for war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there must be obviously be something wrong with what we do. We can't be true, uh, but um, but but I, let me uh, mention to start with all the cases you mentioned. I think I'm I'm quickly looking through the table here for the um, on the liberal democracy index. Um, so one thing that we have that nobody else in this democracy measurement business has are confidence intervals or credible regions, if you like. Uh, it's a Bayesian methodology, but it's essentially confidence intervals, um, and they are overlapping for these cases. So there's a there's a rank order based on the on the point estimate for the liberal democracy index, but there is also that span. Mm -hmm. uh, around it, and for some countries it's wider because there's more uncertainty with the measure, and we don't we don't basically don't pretend that we can measure this without any error uh, or noise. Um, so I think uh, we we try to be honest with the uncertainty and estimate it. And in all these cases, 
uh, I think all of them that you mentioned, they are overlapping. So essentially, although there is sort of a little rank or based on the on the point estimate, when the confidence intervals are overlapping, you can't really say that one is 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 better than the other. Um, and and the same with the like, if you look at the top ten percent uh, uh, c- countries in in our ranking of the liberal democracy index, basically they are indistinguishable. Right. Mm-hmm. We, so mm-hmm. you shouldn't make out. Uh, uh, we 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 try to emphasize this a lot. You should you shouldn't say that, uh, or you shouldn't make too much out of of uh, of uh, differences that appear because of the point estimate without when the confidence intervals are overlapping, and that also goes for countries over time change, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, uh, it's hard though when you see these lists of countries. It's hard not to. Maybe if you just had groups, you know, and didn't separate them out in this, but I understand, I, I get it. But still, there are some striking differences though, nevertheless, mm. that I think are worth, worth thinking about a little bit. John Harbison had a question, which I think is on some people's mind. It's been discussed a lot in Journal of Democracy and elsewhere is, you know, sagging public belief in democracy in different parts of the world. Is that a cause or effect? How does that factor into your measures of, of democracy? Well, first of all, it doesn't factor into our measures at all. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we, we don't measure public opinion and we don't bring in any public opinion data to bear on this. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's not a factor. I think, yes, I've seen that Afrobarometer and also other barometers in the world uh, that in the last few years has been this sagging belief or uh, value put on on uh, democracy, uh, most places it's not dramatic, but it, it's it's a, a reversal of a trend, right? And and that's really worrying. Um, um, uh, the 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 lower the demand for democracy, the less you would see of what you talked about before, Tom, with the civic engagement, the mobilization, mm-hmm. uh, where we saw. I mean, 2019 in our measures, we put we we, we emphasized that in last year's democracy report. 2019, we recorded a record, highest ever uh, level of mobilization across the world for democracy. And mm-hmm. then the pandemic came and sort of put uh, an end to that in many places. But nonetheless, as you also noticed or, or remarked, um, nevertheless, their protests have continued, pro-democratic protests have continued. And we see that going on in Myanmar at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's encouraging, but the siding belief, or the, if that trend continues, it's going to create less demand for democracy, and the, and, the, and that would be a bad thing. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, on the protest question, I read that carefully because at Carnegie we've been giving a lot of attention to protests. We have the Carnegie's Global Protest Tracker, which tries to keep track of significant anti-government protests going on in the world. And whereas you use in your report, you call them uh, sort of protests for democracy and or democracy protests and autocracy protests, I think they're called, or, or authoritarian protests. I was puzzling a bit over democracy protests. We've taken a slightly different approach analytically. We, we tend to find that protests have four or five major drivers. One is, in some cases, political overreach by a regime, like Bolivia, the president tries to stay in power beyond the term. Another, or Belarus, you manipulate an election. Another is more anti-corruption, uh, anger over sort of you know uh, corruption, which is a big driver of protests. Another is more economic tensions, marginalization, um, uh, economic downturn of some type. Then another is social issues, ethnic tensions of that. And so I was puzzling over is something a democracy protest? For example, here's three cases: are the protests in Russia are those do you count those as pro-democracy protests? Some people would say, well, they're actually more about corruption and not necessarily about de- democracy. Or Lebanon. There have been a lot of protests in Lebanon in the last year, a lot of anger in Lebanon at the political system. But are those necessarily pro-democracy? Or, say, the Yellow Vest protests in France. Were those pro-democracy protests? Or were they more economically oriented? Or So I'm a bit puzzled by... Kind of interpreting protesters as this is a pro-democracy protest. How do you make that decision, or where? How is that done? Well, uh, we don't make that decision. 
uh, at the Institute or in the, the VDEM project. These are uh, these are indicators coded by the over 3,500 country experts. Uh, that is, a majority of them are scholars, uh, about 84% mm -hmm. of scholars uh, uh, who are have a certified expertise in, in studying, say, civil society in the Philippines um, mm -hmm. and echo that question. And we, we the, the clarification we put to them is that events are pro-democratic if they are organized with the explicit aim to advance and or protect democratic institutions, such as free and fair elections, uh, courts and parliaments, or if they are in support of civil liberties, such as freedom of association and speech. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and we asked them to, to then code the extent to which mobilization in their uh, country uh, that they code, in the country they code, uh, had, that, had those characteristics. Yeah, I think I'm reminded of, Stefan, it's, I worry a little bit, as you know, it's been a preoccupation of mine over the years about democratic tele teleological thinking mm. or the tendency of some democracy analysts to interpret things in democracy terms. I remember being on a panel back with Max Boot at the Council on Foreign Relations years ago about the, in Iraq, and it was soon after the U.S. intervention in Iraq or a few years later, and he said, Iraqis, have, they had elections, Iraqis have gone out to vote for democracy. And I said, you know, I was thinking of the Balkans in the early 90s. People will go out to vote when they're given the chance, often to protect their ethnic interests and to safeguard their situation. They're not voting for democracy per se. They're given a chance to vote, and they interpret that as an opportunity to go out and protect their immediate interests. So if a protest is, this is a bit of a debate these days in Washington, you know, a protest in Russia for, what Navalny calls a protest, is that a protest for democracy in Russia, or is that a protest against certain things that they're unhappy with. So understand about the 3,500 certified experts, but it strikes me as a very difficult decision to say when is a protest for democracy as opposed for a particular interest, which might serve a democratic process over time. Mm. Yeah, in our measure, the, the, in the instructions to the coders, they should have explicit uh, aims uh, to advance democracy or democratic institutions or associated li liberties, right? And uh, for both Russia and, and Lebanon, the scores are pretty high in 2018, 19, um, uh, uh, sort of on this scale from zero to four around, uh, I'm looking at it here now, 3.5, uh, 3 to 3.5. Uh, but um, with a big drop for Russia in 2020, um, in in terms of uh, the how how much of pro democratic mobilization there have, have has been. Yeah, let me since this is an event based in Washington, I can't let you guys get away with asking you a policy question related to U.S. policy, even though that has actually it's not the mandate of your institute. But too bad you're here. I'm going to ask it of you anyway. Um, there are two questions. One is Trudy Whalen, uh, Philadelphia Inquirer, um, asks uh, Biden Summit for Democracies. Uh, it's a good idea. How does that How does that sound to your ears uh, in Gothenburg when you hear about that? And that's related to Bill Wanlin's question of Can the United States serve as a uh, democracy supporter, given all the damage to democracy? Uh, I just little plug here. I just published an article with Francis Brown in American Purpose on Wednesday, a bit on that topic called the chastened power. But uh, you're here. Um, give us a thought about this perspective on you at the U.S. role or U.S. policy. You want to go first? <laughs> well, I'm a U.S. boy. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the, on the on the last question, uh, I read your your piece, uh, Tom, and I I intend to agree with most of what you wrote there. I think um, it's, that's a very Swedish way of saying you violently disagreed with it. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I, I'm not that that um, Swedish anymore, uh, and definitely not British, right? Uh, um, oh, how interesting! Means you know, it's the worst. Thing you have ever heard, um, but <laughs> no, I think I, especially uh, when it, you know, especially when it comes to um, uh, more generally, not only for the United States. I think this goes for the EU as well to 
um, have an end to the export model, as you put it. Um, mm -hmm. Stop thinking about democracy support in the world as something we do and export to other countries. Um, I think that was uh, m maybe misguided to begin with and definitely not uh, a viable strategy going forward. Well, you have uh, enormous challenges to democracy as I see it in the US. Uh, um, it was, um, uh, I mean, the outlook is better now than it was before, I think, uh, in the, the previous four years. Uh, but still enormous challenges. And and we have it in Europe too, including in Sweden. Uh, we have a party in, in the legislature that has uh, 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 roots in neo-Nazi uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, we, we can, uh, we should never have, uh, had, uh, have we should never have, have the approach of sort of common export and uh, democracy um, and much less now so. It's a, it's a joint problem. Um, we have problems uh, here. Uh, there are problems other places. Let's uh, together see what we can do and learn from each other um, in terms of how the decline in democracy and the autocratization can be turned around. And Biden Summit for Democracy, is that likely, do you think, in Stockholm and sort of policy circles or to be greeted with uh, like, yeah, we'd like to be part of that or, or with skepticism? Um, I think the idea of the United States being the, the leader uh, in, in a global summit is met with skepticism. I think the, uh, what I hear from, from EU folks is that the need for something like that is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very glad, I mean, the, the, the German foreign minister, for example, called for a Marshall Plan for democracy not too mm -hmm. long ago. Um, and, and it seems like Germany is willing to step back into the ring in, in, in supporting mm -hmm. democracy uh, uh, and, and takes the issues they have domestically seriously. And, and that's encouraging, I think. Um, but I agree also with what you wrote in that piece that it, it has to be uh, much broader, not only uh, about governments, uh, we mm -hmm. need to bring in other, all these civic actors, um, and, all, mm -hmm. and also it needs to be much more on, on uh, an equal footing and a dialogue uh, framework than sort of um, uh, here we should proclaim yeah. do okay. one, two, three. All right, we're going to finish up. Um, Brigitte, any final thought you'd like to add before we close and step on Brigitte? No, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. Stefan? Um, yeah. Uh, no, no, not really. I mean, it was a pleasure to, to be invited to, to have this conversation with you and, and present uh, some of the findings of the Democracy Report. Um, and uh, a pleasure to, to uh, uh, be invited to do that with you, Brigitte, as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, we'll take a look. There are some interesting questions in the comments or questions that we haven't had a chance to get to, but you may want to follow up with some of them. Uh, both Stefan and Brigitte are very findable online, so those who want to follow up with them, I'm sure they'll be responsive. Sorry we couldn't get to every single question, but it's been a fun discussion. Keep up the good work. This is a very important uh, index that you guys are, <clears throat> you know, the whole analytic project is very important, including the annual report, but I, I salute you for what you do, and it's useful for all of us, and we look forward to more. Thanks, everybody in the audience for joining us, and we'll see you again at the next Carnegie event. Thank you. Goodbye.